Pemba spread tainted seeds, born from incest upon the ground. Pharaoh, his righteous twin brother that dwelt in heaven and took the form of a fish, was forced to sacrifice himself for Pemba's sin. His body was cut into 60 pieces, and the pieces formed trees which spread across the earth. Trees are, according to the Mande people, symbols of resurrection. The Most High God brought Pharaoh back to life and sent him to earth in human form aboard an ark. The ark, which landed on Mount Corolla, was of course loaded with a small group of humans and two of every animal. The Incas of Peru tell the story of a creator god named Veracocha, who created the world that was populated by giants he carved from stone. These giants were terribly disobedient and disorderly, and Veracocha destroyed this race of giants with a massive flood. The Hindu tradition of India, like countless others, often describes gods as taking human form and incarnating on earth. The many incarnations of Vishnu upon the earth are certainly modeled after and considered to be a savior figure. The first incarnation of the benevolent god Vishnu arrived to earth in the form of a fish and warned a man named Manu of a coming flood. The fish informed Manu to build a massive ark which, needless to say, saved Manu's life. In the Aztec mythologies of Mexico, only two humans survive a massive flood, Koshkoshli and his wife, Shokiketzel, survived the great inundation in a boat they were told to construct prior to the flood. After the subsiding of the flood waters, their boat came to rest on a tall mountain. And yet another Central American tradition, that of a tribe called the Mesocanaics, the god Tezcatlipoca desired to destroy all of mankind. This god, however, schemed to spare a small group of humans to repopulate the planet after the coming flood. So he spared a man named Tezpi, his wife, and their family in a large boat which, as usual, they were told to build and subsequently load with various animals. As the flood waters began to diminish, Tezpi sent out a vulture to assess whether the boat could be disembarked. The vulture did not return, nor did some of the other birds Tezpi released. Finally he released a hummingbird, which did return with a branch in its mouth, confirming for Tezpi the presence of dry land. Tezpi, his family, and a multitude of animals depart from the ship and repopulate the earth. In the Popol Vuh, the sacred stories of the Mayans, the great god created humans by carving them from wood, but soon humanity lost the grace of the creator because they had forgotten him. So he sent a huge flood to consume disobedient humanity. Only a single couple, dubbed the great father and mother, survived this cataclysm to repopulate the earth. The Chipka people of Colombia tell the story of a man named Bochica, who came upon them long ago. He was an old man of a different race from the Chipkas and sported a long, thick beard. He taught the locals, who lived as barbarians, how to live civilized and in peace with each other. Bochica's wife, on the other hand, wasn't so great. She caused a global flood that nearly wiped out humanity. The furious Bochica banished his wife Chia and dissipated the waters. The Canarian people of Ecuador, the Inuit people of Alaska, and the Luceno tribe of Southern California tell tales of a small remnant of humanity surviving a great flood by taking refuge on mountaintops. The Chickasaw people of America's Dakota region say that a great flood destroyed all of humanity with the exception of a small family and two of every creature. And as for the Jews and Muslims, they pretty much echo the Bible's version of events. And of course you have the aforementioned Noah, whose family survived a massive flood in a boat with two of every animal, released birds to indicate the presence of dry land, and landed upon a mountain. Did humanity have a collective bad dream? Did a deluge of biblical proportions leave an imprint so deep that none were left unscathed? How did the traditions of so many civilizations who never made contact come to contain so many corresponding details, even minor, seemingly trivial ones? Imagine it. You arrive to a crime scene and start the investigation by talking to witnesses. Although I'd hate to make the truth a popularity contest, you'd be forgiven for disregarding the testimony of two witnesses who report a story wildly different than the other observers. Fortunately for me, a popularity contest requires contest, and there is none, or none who do. 
Even occultists speak of the flood that wiped out the noble Nephilim. Bottom line, a wicked race of both humans and non-humans, an angry creator, a small family warned by a god, two of every creature on a boat, a big damn flood, and humanity reborn. That's one hell of a dream. Another reoccurring theme throughout the mythologies is man's loss of paradise. This story, whose most popular variation occurs in the Bible, details man's plight from a worry-free life to an existence of suffering and hardship. But as usual, the Bible is not alone in describing humanity's fall from grace. Just as the Christians have the Garden of Eden, the Persians have Eden. Eden was, according to Persian tradition, the first habitation of humans. It was a paradise where suffering and toil were unknown. It wasn't until the primal couple was seduced by an evil spirit in the form of a serpent were they expelled from Eden. In Greek mythology, the Garden of Hesperides was a land to the far west of the globe where golden apples of immortality grew. In the Mayan Papal Vu, the first men lived in a paradise and were able to see far. This meant that humans could see extremely distant things as if they were near. This ability was stripped from those men, and their subsequent generations could only see things that were near. The confusion of man's languages is yet another repetitive motif. The Bible, as usual, contains the most famous version of this story. As stated earlier, a king called Nimrod desired to build a tower to reach to the heavens. His arrogance and presumption was punished when God caused all of Nimrod's laborers to abruptly speak different languages. From there, the people dispersed to every corner of the globe. This story, like the Flood, has many parallels outside of the Bible. The Aztec people of Mexico say that at one time giants of deformed stature once possessed the land. Arrogant were these giants who endeavored to build a tower so as to reach to the heavens. When the Lord of Heaven looked upon the haughty ambition of the earth dwellers, he sent down his minions to quote unquote confound them. This action caused the builders of the tower to go their separate ways and disperse across the earth. And then there's the savior figure, the character who, similar to the flood, seems like an imprint in the mind that was left by a dream, yet a pleasant dream this time. The wanderer, the civilizer, the magician, the chosen one, the incarnated God, the sacrificed. He was all of these things. Typical of the West, the most famous savior figure is Jesus Christ. What Christians have generally agreed on regarding this savior is, he's the only son of God, or was God, he was born from a virgin, he was prophesied to come, he would, in the latter part of his life, travel around with twelve apostles, teaching goodness and performing miracles. He would later, quote unquote, die for our sins by being nailed to a wooden cross. His body was placed in a cave and, after three days, his body disappeared and returned to heaven. In heaven he resides to this day, promising to return and rule for a thousand years, and afterwards he will live forevermore with God. The Hindus have many incarnations of the Most High God, Vishnu. Vishnu, who resides in heaven, came upon man in many forms, and these forms are called avatars. An avatar is essentially a god in the flesh. For example, Krishna, one of the ten avatars of Vishnu, was born from the womb of a human woman in order to fight the demons that plagued humanity. The first incarnation of Vishnu was that of a fish man. Nine incarnations of Vishnu have already arrived, whereas the tenth avatar will arrive to earth during the end of the world riding a white horse and fighting for righteousness. There is a similar account in the Bible where a character who fights for justice and rides a white horse will arrive during the end times. The aforementioned